Even you heard it here first. He ought to copyright that song. If he had not told us, we'd all thought a, a famous songwriter would have written that. But uh, if you have your Bibles today, would you turn to the New Testament book of Colossians, chapter 1? We're going to look at verse 24 through chapter 2 and verse 3. We'll be looking at that in just a moment as you're turning there. And I was looking this past week at some statements that various uh, pastors and church leaders over history have shared about the church, and I wanted to share a few. You know my first one would be Adrian Rogers, uh, but Adrian Rogers said, the church is not the way to heaven, but the church is the sign that points to heaven. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, the church is the church only when it exists for others. Chuck Colson said, I don't think the job of the church is to make people happy. The job of the church is to make people holy. Dwight L. Moody said this, church attendance is as vital to a disciple as a transfusion of rich, healthy blood is to a sick person. Corey Timboom said this, be united with other Christians. A wall with loose bricks is not good. The bricks must be cemented together. And then finally, C.S. Lewis said this, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men unto Christ. You know, whether you've been a lifetimer or new to the church, it's important for us to realize this morning that the church is integral to the work of the Lord. It's integral for an individual's personal spiritual growth. We grow better when we have the accountability and the fellowship that a community of believers brings to us. But it also is beneficial to the advancement of God's kingdom because we're able to do more when we're together than any one of us can do individually. We looked at the church briefly last week and the truth that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. The church is not an organization, it's an organism. It's a living entity. And we saw last week that Jesus is the head of the church, not the pastor nor the deacons. But Paul continues the discussion about the church today in our text as we look at his particular relationship and role in the church. Look with me, beginning in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24. Paul writes, Now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church. I have become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. For I want you to know how greatly I am struggling for you, for those in Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me in person. I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love, so that we may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ, in him are hidden, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let's pray. Father, as we uh, uh, continue our study in Colossians today, Lord, we thank you for the church, the bride of Christ. Lord, you love the church, and if we love you, Lord, there should be a great love for the local church. We thank you for this example of Paul who gave himself sacrificially as a servant in the ministry to and through the church. And Father, as we study today, just speak to our hearts about our place, our importance in this organism, which is the church of the living Lord, and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. You know, in our text uh, this morning, as you were reading through it, there's one sort of glaring verse probably that jumps out, and that is uh, verse 24 that really needs clarification. Uh, verse 24 here of chapter 1. I hope to do that in a few moments. But today, really, as we're looking at this text, we're looking at Paul and the church, Paul's relationship to the church, the value of the church 
uh, to the Apostle Paul. And the church is not the brick and mortar, this structure that we are uh, sitting in the midst of today, but it is the people of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul's consuming desire was that he be able to work on behalf of the church and that he work through the church to reach those and draw people in. You know, there are people today who say, I do not need the local church. I'm, I'm a believer. I'm fine. I have my personal time with the Lord. Uh, I have that relationship with the Lord, and I don't need the church. That's not what God's word is teaching today. It's not reflected in any way that this would be true. A believer left to himself or herself would be like a piece of coal that falls off a mound of charcoal bricks. Uh, uh, and as it is separated before long, that piece of coal will become very cold. And such can be the case. And so Paul here has a great passion for the church. And he shares his heart about the church. He shares his relationship with the church. And while he was an apostle and none of us will ever be an apostle, that was a foundational gift given to the church. It's important for us to be able to glean something from Paul's attitude toward the church here today. So I want to look at two points this morning, Paul's dedication to the church and then Paul's ministry in the church. But before we look at this first point that Paul sacrificially dedicated himself to the church, we must address the elephant in the room, which is verse 24 of chapter 1, because it, in initial reading, it just doesn't sound right. Paul says, now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is, the church. Now, what does Paul mean when he says, basically, I'm supplicating what Jesus did? In other words, I'm making up for, I'm adding to what he did. Now, Paul is speaking to the essential nature of his ministry, but I think it's important for us first to know what he is not saying here. When he speaks of the body, Christ's afflictions for his body, that's speaking of the ministry to the church. But, but Paul is not saying that Jesus' death on the cross was not sufficient. He's not saying that at all because it is through faith in Christ that a person comes into the church, into the body of Christ. And he's also not saying that anyone can by his or her own works add anything to the work of Christ alone in salvation. In fact, we can argue that in many letters, Paul emphasized the fact that it was faith in Christ alone that would lead to salvation. Specifically, the books of Romans and Galatians address the fact that there's nothing that man can add to the work of Christ. But what does he mean here? He's not speaking about adding to the substance of that salvific work of Christ here. He's not saying that at all. The word completing means completing in the place of another, sort of stepping in the place of another. Elsewhere, Paul writes, of us as being an ambassador for Christ. What does an ambassador do? It represents one to another. Also, the word completing means contributing our share toward. And so Paul is saying, I'm contributing my share toward what Christ has already done. As we look back, we know that Jesus died and he rose again. And we know that he rose on the third day and that he was on this earth for 40 days proving uh, the truth that he indeed was physically raised from the dead. He was, the, as we saw, the firstborn uh, from the dead. But then we know after that period of 40 days that Jesus ascended to be with the Father. Now you remember that Jesus left his disciples a great commission. You remember that before he died, he told his disciples, it is for your benefit that I go, because if I don't go, the comforter, the Holy Spirit would not come with you. And so it was very important to Jesus when he left this earth physically, that he 
delegate the responsibility of carrying the gospel to those who would follow him. So Paul is not in any way saying that he is adding to the work of Christ. His, his work in the ministry was that now that Christ was physically with the Father in heaven, that he was given, along with others, the responsibility in the flesh of fulfilling what was lacking. And that was bringing to people's knowledge what Jesus Christ had done. And so in that way, he was adding to the, to the word. But I want you to see also that he speaks about not only that responsibility of proclaiming in the flesh what Christ has done, but also he speaks of his attitude toward the ch church. He said, I have become its servant. If you have been in the state of Virginia uh, this week, we had a, a famous and great basketball coach retire, Tony Bennett. I'm a Virginia Tech fan, but I love Tony Bennett, all right? And if you watched his interview, if you hadn't, I would encourage you to, to watch his press conference. Uh, but as he began to share about that, he shared, he said this, this team, this program was only on loan to me. It was not mine. It was not my possession. I've served that, and now it's time for me to release that. That's the spirit of a Christian. That's a Christian coach. He understands it was on loan to him from the Lord. And that's the spirit that Paul has here in, in this epistle. He says, I'm just a servant. I have an important role. It's not my church. It's the Lord's church, and I'm called to serve the church. And so that word servant is the word from which, you know, we get the word deacon, which means uh, literally through the dust. It's a dignified service. Nonetheless, it was a service. Now, specifically, Paul was an apostle. He was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and he was elevated to this position only by the Lord himself. Now, there are no apostles today on the earth. I don't care what anybody says. They must misrepresent the word or misunderstand it because the, uh, the uh, apostles were foundational. They were inceptive gifts that were given to specific individuals who had direct contact and a direct commission from the Lord. Paul received that on the road to Damascus. And so when that foundation is laid, you don't go and lay a second, a third, a fourth foundation. It was a foundational gift. And so Paul had the blessing of being an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. But even as an apostle, he was a servant of the church. The only time he even asserted his apostleship, uh, you might say, would be like in Philemon uh, when he was trying to encourage Philemon to receive back Onesimus. And he, he did that not to say, hey, I'm an apostle, but he did that to appeal for the sake of these brothers in Christ. And so as we think about Paul as a servant, even though he was an apostle, do you really think that he enjoyed suffering? He didn't. Do you think that he enjoyed having trouble from the Jews? He did not. Did you think that he liked being misrepresented and misunderstood? He did not. But he did all of this for the church. He served the church. You know, we give so little thought to the church today. People will say, I've done my time. I've served the Lord. And, 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 and now it's time for someone else. Or, or others will say, I've tried to serve the Lord in the church, but really the position I have is not an acclaimed position. It's not really appreciated and we give in. We ought to be like Paul. We ought to be excited to invest ourselves and our energies in the ministry of the local church in the eternal things of God in and through the church. You know, statistics say that the average Christian gives about two hours a week to the ministry of the church. And that's about 1.2% of our week. And a lot of that is spectator. Uh, statistics in 2023 said that we give on average $17 dollars per week through the ministry of the local church based on the average salary. That's about 2.1% of what we make. These two numbers averaged out time and money are 1.65%, one out of 100%, 1.65% of the church. Paul said, I've become the servant of the church. I have become the servant of the Lord through the ministry of the church. These numbers really don't represent that. 
So Paul dedicated himself to the ministry of the church. I wonder about you. Are you, are you committed to the ministry of the local church? Are you looking, God, are there ways that you can reach people, ways that you can support people, ways that you can encourage people, ways that you can bring, bring people into the church through me? And so we see Paul was sold out, sacrificially dedicated to the church. But I want to look secondly that Paul carried out his mission to the church because there was an intent behind that. It wasn't just that he loved the church, that he was dedicated to the church, but he was committed to the mission of the church. Now, Paul was saved, as is described in Acts chapter 9, on the road to Damascus. And leading up to that point in his life, by his own testimony given later, twice in the book of Acts, Paul had set himself prior to that time against the church of the Lord. In fact, he did everything that he could do to work against the ministry of the church. In fact, on the road to Damascus, he was even on the way to deliver those who followed Christ over to death. He was totally opposed to Christianity. And Jesus met him on the road and rebuked him. And he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And when he meant that, he was persecuting what? The church. The church was the body of Christ. Christ uh, died for the church. And so he said, why are you doing this to me? And so Paul, who saw this great light, received instruction from the Lord. And God was also working in a man named Ananias. Don't you love the people like Ananias in the Bible? We don't know a lot about them. They may appear just briefly. We know they must have lived godly lives because God called Ananias to do something bold, to go and speak a message to the Apostle Paul. And Ananias had the faith in God to, to send this message. And God told him, he said, this man, Paul, is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles. He must suffer much. Now, what was Paul's mission? Paul was to be an apostle. He was sent from the Lord Jesus Christ, one directly commissioned of the Lord. And so he was called to take the gospel not just to the Jews who heard first, but also to the Gentiles. And that's why he speaks in verse 25 of a commission that was given to him from the Lord for you, for the church. He was given this responsibility. So while we don't share the ministry that Paul had specifically, we share some things in common, and it's this. God has called us to serve in the local church. I wonder today... Do you ever stop and ask God, what do you desire from me in the church? Do you ever take the time and say, God, why do you have me at Concord Baptist Church? What is my ministry? Might it be in music, Lord? Might it be ministering to young people? I remember when I was young, there was a man, Jack Martin. Uh, he was an older guy. We used to sit third row left of the preacher, he sat second row. Every week he would check my fingernails. If I hadn't bitten them, he'd give me a quarter. Now his work didn't work. I still bite my fingernails. I'm 59 years old. I was watching a ball game. My favorite team had won. I went back and watched it a little bit later when they weren't playing well. I was still biting my fingernails. I said, why am I doing this? I know how the result's going to be. But Jack Martin was this. He took an interest in me as a child. So when I would come to church, that was one of the highlights. I remember now, I mattered to him. He was thinking of me. Sometimes it's something as simple as just a child or a widow just ministering and, and having that ministry. And understand, God has placed me here to do this. Paul had a commission, and he filled that commission. And we see three things that he did. The first is this. He proclaimed Christ to those who did not know Jesus. That's a ministry beyond the walls of the church, but it is a ministry of the church. Notice what he says in verse 25. I've become its servant according to God's command that was given to me for you to do what? For the purpose of making the word of God fully known. In other words, Paul was saying it's not just about me, but God has called me to make his word known, to make his word known to those who did not know him. The mystery Paul Singer had shared with me, the most important mystery ever. He said, not that John F. Kennedy, who, who shot John F. Kennedy, the most important mystery ever 
is that people know the gospel in this mystery that was hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints. This mystery that for those who did not understand the gospel, God had given to Paul to make that mystery known, not only that it might be revealed that Christ had come to the Gentiles, that Christ was Lord, not just to the Jews, but all peoples, but that people would be able to experience it. And so the content of that mystery is Christ in us, the people, the nations, the light of salvation. Do you realize that God has given us this same responsibility today? Some of you had the privilege of being a part of the um, crusade a number of weeks ago. Wasn't it a joy to see people respond to the gospel in great numbers, to see people broken, to see people who were serious about doing business with God? That's the ministry of the church. We're to take the gospel to other people, and it's through our servant's heart. It's through ministering to needs. It's through bringing people into church so that they can meet in the fellowship. We had a, a great opportunity the other night with the ladies' fellowship. We have another big opportunity this coming Saturday with uh, our stew and our fall fellowship and our trunk or treat. Are you inviting people to come out? Are you sharing with someone, I want you to come with me. I want you to be a part of this. That's part of our ministry, our ministry is to always be alert to our community. I wonder today, does it bother you that people you know don't know Jesus? It should. It should stir your heart. You should be praying for them and witnessing them. Paul considered it important that his ministry be to those who did not know Christ, to connect people in the life of the body as they would trust Christ. But I want you to see a second thing. He invested in the lives of Christians in order to help them grow. In other words, we proclaim, he says in verse 28, we proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Now, when a person accepts Christ, that is a baby in Christ. That's not a mature, that's a living person who's moved from death to spiritual life, but that person is in the inceptive stage of the Christian life, not maturity. So Paul says, I proclaim the mystery that the Gentiles would come to know the truth of God that has been clouded because of their sin. I, I, I do that, but also, I also labor hard, striving within the church to help people who know Christ to grow in Christ. That word uh, labor for this striving, the word striving is a, a descriptive word from which we get our English word agonize. Uh, and so if you agonize over something, you're not indifferent to it. It really, really stirs you. Really the picture of this uh, word in the Greek is that of a sprinter who is stretching toward the tape, extending everything forward to get there first. And so we see here that Paul wanted to see people grow in Christ and he wanted to be involved in the process of it. And it was a process. That wasn't like a sprint. It was more like a marathon or an ultra marathon. I met somebody yesterday who did an ultra marathon last week, 37 miles. I didn't know people did that. He said he wasn't really able to walk much until midweek. He said he was so weak. But what we're talking about here is not a sprint in the Christian life, but investing in time. A children's worker who week after week pours in brick upon brick a young person's life. People who are ministering time after time to a neighbor or a friend, maybe not getting a positive response initially, but continuing in that. And so Paul was invested not just in seeing people come to Christ, but that people might be presented mature in Christ, helping believers grow. You know, so many people in my life have invested in me. I think as a child, uh, the people who invested in me, John Gillette was our uh, royal ambassador leader. Every week, 
he showed up and he taught us as young men. I think of Bob Hubbard who taught me uh, in sixth grade uh, boys Sunday school class who would take us out and minister to families in need at Christmas and I can remember sitting in some places that had a wood stove it felt like 110 degrees in there I was ready to get out of the place but he was training us and teaching us about what it meant uh, to live for Christ. Doyle Chauncey who was my pastor had passed away a couple of years ago was so integral in my life he led me to the Lord he, he took me and he trained me and then uh, gave me opportunities in service. Pastor Willie, who many of you know, my own father, Joe Vaughn, people like that who poured into me and invested that I might be able to grow. And I'm still growing and I'm still dependent on people to do the ministry uh, to me. But I want you to see a final thing. He encouraged people. Notice chapter 2 and verse 1. He says, I want you to know how greatly I'm struggling for you. You know, sometimes people just need to know they matter. Uh, God may be putting someone in your heart right now, and, and the Spirit of God may be saying, you know, you need to call and tell somebody, I'm really thinking about you. You really matter to me. Paul says, I'm struggling for you. I'm struggling for those in Laodicea, you know, that infamous church that's spoken uh, about three or four decades after this in the book of the Revelation was a church that was not located too far from Colossae there. And so this letter in Colossae may well have gotten around to uh, Laodicea and we looked at Hierapolis. It would be sort of like here to prospect, uh, very close. And so he says, I'm laboring. I'm laboring for you. You matter to me. And for all who have not seen me in person, in other words, he felt like what lacked for them. He, he labored for them. He says, I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love. One ministry that is so important in the church is the ch ministry of encouragement exhorting others, saying, hey, I'm praying for you. I'm thinking about you. I'm striving with you. I'm laboring with you. You matter. It may be with someone who's going through a life crisis. It may be uh, towards someone who is going through a series of doubt. It may be someone who just needs to be confronted or challenged, but we need each other. You may say, well, I can't teach. I can't preach. There are a lot of things I cannot do. There are some things you can do, and one thing that's very essential in the church is the ministry of encouragement. As we read these verses, Paul is just so enthusiastic, and it's all about Christ, because notice what he says in verse 3, in him, Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see, Paul wanted people to know Christ. He wanted people to grow in Christ. And he wanted to encourage them. He proclaimed. He taught. The scripture says that he warned. Uh, that's appealing to the will. Uh, warning someone. When you warn someone about something, you're appealing to that person's will. You're going this way and you need to will yourself in a, in a different way. Teaching, appealing to the mind. Encouragement, appealing to the spirit. Paul was consumed with doing the ministry of the church. You know, I've been involved in a number of groups and activities over my life, and, and I've enjoyed them. I mean, I, I was a member of clubs when I was in high school. Um, I was a member of a fraternity when I was in college at Hamden, Sydney. Was have been a member of a number of athletic teams, but I can tell you, as I stand here truthfully, there is nothing more joy-giving more fulfilling, more essential than being a part of the body of Christ, than being a member of the church because the work that is done here is eternal in nature, not for time. Those things that I've been in the past, they had a season that I'm not a part of those things anymore, but I will always be a part of the ministry of the local church. God has given us the church. He's given us our heart for the church. I pray you have that heart. I pray the desire that Paul had, that attitude of, I want to sacrifice for the church. You know, when we get to those Wednesday nights and it's tired, tired, I can't drag myself out anymore, we say, but I'm going to do it for the Lord. 
I'm going to serve the Lord. When we get fatigued, when we have things that are going on and, and maybe we're, we're serving and we're not seeing the numbers where we would like them to be, we're saying, God, I'm a servant of you. I'm not basing this on what I think. I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to serve. I promise you this. The reward is abundant. You know, when we give ourselves to the Lord, it's abundant, the return. We saw it in the lesson today. Here was Abraham who followed the will of God, said, Lot, you choose first. Lot impulsively went and chose everything after all the dust settled, and Abraham had the second choice. God did what? He took him out and said, look to the north, south, east, and west. All I have is yours. You know, when we work out in the secular world for a boss, that boss may love the Lord or may not. But when we do the work of the church, we have a good boss, a boss who's worthy of our respect and love. And when we give ourselves to him, there is nothing better that we can invest our lives in than the ministry of the local church. How about you? Where's God leading you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can be a part of this church that Paul mentioned. Lord, the church is not perfect. The church is not to be esteemed above the Lord Jesus Christ. But Lord, the church matters as we have seen. It is not the way to salvation, but it is a signpost to point people to Jesus who is the way of salvation. Lord, give us a heart for the church that Paul had. Give us a desire, Lord, to be involved in the ministry of the church. Lord, help us as a church to look for and provide opportunities for people to invest in women and men and young people. And Lord, we pray that all that would be done would be for your glory. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.